If you want to get your Bibles and turn to John chapter 7, we're going to be looking at that chapter this morning and appreciate Cain uh, being in the back and uh, passing out those handouts uh, to those who are coming in. If you did not get one, uh, Cain's still uh, there in the back with those handouts and you can grab one from him. We get your Bibles and let's look at John chapter 7 and uh, try to uh, get a, uh, a better understanding and appreciation for this good chapter. I hope you are uh, reading these chapters ahead of time before we come to class so that you have some, uh, some level of knowledge about the content of the chapters. Obviously, we cannot cover them uh, verse by verse. And so uh, if you already know some of the things that are in the chapter, that'll help us. But uh, we'll look this morning at some of these uh, uh, vital concepts that we can grasp from this chapter. But I want to spend most of our time, hopefully, uh, looking at uh, the main theme from this chapter and how it's developed uh, throughout these verses. Uh, and then you can see on your handout, probably won't reach it, but uh, some of the things at the back page of your handout, some of the things that are contained in this chapter that help to uh, fulfill the purpose for which John was writing. Well, let's briefly look at some of these vital concepts and truths uh, from this chapter. One of the ones that I think we see at the very beginning here is we see it in the life of Jesus. And that is that we need to serve God even if our family doesn't help us do it. Even if our family opposes us in what we're doing. We see that in the life of Jesus and we see that because of the opposition that he had from his own brothers. It's hard to believe, on the one hand, it's hard to believe that Jesus' own flesh and blood, as it were, his own half-brothers, did not believe in him. Grew up in that home together. Uh, did Mary believe in him? Did Mary know that there was something special about him? Do you think that she taught that to her children? Do you think that she imparted that to them in some way? But they didn't want to believe it. He had at least four brothers, uh, had at least two sisters. Um, so Mary had at least seven children that, that we know of from Scripture. But until his resurrection, his own brothers didn't believe in him. Do you have anybody in your family that makes serving God not so easy? Um, do you have anybody in your family that perhaps when you go to visit, uh, have a family reunion or whatever it might be, that uh, being a Christian is not the easiest thing to do? That getting up and going to worship that Sunday when nobody else might be doing it is not the easiest thing to do? Jesus had those who weren't ready to help him to serve God, but yet he remained steadfast in trying to do that. And I think that's a great lesson and concept for us to learn. Look at verse 17. John chapter 7, verse 17, Jesus says, If anyone wills to do his will, if anyone truly desires, has a strong determination to do the will of God, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. If somebody truly wants to do the will of God, if somebody truly wants to know the will of God, what does this verse say? He's going to have it. He's going to know it. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. If somebody wants to do the will of God, is God going to help them? If someone is looking for the truth, is yearning, yearning for the truth, is God going to help them find it? I think that's what Jesus is teaching. John chapter 7 uh, and verse 17. Look in verse 24. This is an interesting verse because uh, most people go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, misuse Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, and then ignore John chapter 7 verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. And so what do most people say about that verse? Oh, you're not supposed to judge. Don't judge me. Jesus said not to judge. Well, yeah, forget the rest of the verses. Uh, you know, you, you follow that on down and read through the rest of Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus was not saying, don't you judge anybody. Jesus was saying, 
with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Those that we judge, whatever measure we use towards them, that same measure is going to be used back towards us. Now take Matthew 7, 1 and 2, put John 7, verse 24 next to it. Jesus says, don't you judge according to appearance. That's the easy thing to do. Easy, oh, that doesn't look right. You know, he looks kind of funny. She looks kind of weird. Don't judge. I wasn't even pointing your direction when I said that, Gene. Why are you laughing? Don't judge according to appearance, but what? But what? What's the word that you have in John chapter 7 and verse 24 after the word but? But judge. Don't judge according to appearance, but judge. It's a command. It's an imperative. It is Jesus saying, go and do this. Now do what? Judge with righteous judgment. Where do we get righteous judgment? It's right here, isn't it? How many times... In, uh, in Scripture, especially when you read Psalm 119, how many times in Psalm 119 are the words of God called the judgments of God? God has already made some judgments, hasn't He? Has God already made the judgment about what is righteous and what is not righteous? Can I know what righteousness is? Yes. Based upon the words of righteousness. So if I can know what righteousness is, can I know what unrighteousness is? I can know that too. And Jesus says, I have a responsibility to judge with righteous judgment. It's interesting the context that that verse is found in, that there were these individuals who were trying to judge Jesus and to judge what he was doing based upon appearance, but basically he's telling them, hey guys, Get back into the Word. If you'll get back into the Word, you won't be judging unrighteously. Get back into the Bible and you'll understand what I'm doing is actually according to truth. Vital concept, what, number four? I don't remember what number we're on. Personal expectations. Personal beliefs. Um, personal traditions. Can they get in the way sometimes? Can they cause us not to know the truth? Can they cause us not to see the truth, to find the truth? Look at some of these things and we'll try to come back and look at them more in their context. Look at verse 27. Here were some of the Jews who were saying, however we know where this man is from. Well, he's from Galilee. That's where he came from, they thought. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Really? Is that what the Bible teaches? Does the Bible teach that when the Christ came, nobody would know where he was from? No. But that's what their tradition had taught them. That's what they had come to believe. And so they took what they had come to believe and put it over the top of what could actually be known and what truths could actually be seen. In verse 35... They said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and to teach the Greeks? Again, they, they had a, a, uh, a personal hatred, dislike towards the Gentiles. Oh, surely he's not going to go. You know, he says he's going to go away from us. Is he even going to go over to the Gentiles? Well, they didn't think so. Was the gospel going to go to the Greeks? Was it going to go to the Gentiles? Yes, and you see their personal uh, prejudices coming out in some of these statements. Is it possible today that some of our personal beliefs, traditions, prejudices, ex expectations, can they get in the way of truth? What do we need? We need to lay those things aside and allow the truth to speak for itself. A couple more concepts and then I want to get to this theme. We've already noticed in verse 27 this context, but it's possible for someone to know some things 
and even some things about the Bible, but not actually know the Lord. Look at verse 26. But look, he speaks boldly, and they, the Jewish rulers, they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from, even if you're going to try to act like you don't. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. If you'll look in those, uh, how many verses did I read? Three or four verses? If you'll look in those three or four verses, look at how many times the word know is there. Verse 26, do the rulers know indeed? Verse 27, however, we know where this man is from. The end of verse 27, no one knows where he is from. Jesus says, verse 28, you both know me. You know where I am from, but guess what? You don't know God. There's some things that you can know. Even some Bible truths that you can know. But if you don't properly apply them, and if you misuse them, Jesus says, oh, you can know some things, but even knowing some things, not know the Lord. Not be acceptable to Him. One more concept. And that is that uh, if you don't know what you're talking about, you ought to be quiet. Um, these Jews were making fools of themselves in what they were doing. Uh, and, and opening their mouths and saying things that they really didn't know what they were talking about. Look at verse 15. The Jews marveled, saying, How does this man, and, and this is the new King James, the King James is very similar, how does this man know letters? In other words, how does he have learning, having never been educated, having, having never studied? They looked at Jesus, they looked at the Christ, the Messiah, and they said, how does this guy know anything? He's never been educated. Yeah. If you're saying that about Jesus, if you're questioning how Jesus knows anything, where did he get his smarts? How did he come to know the law? You probably ought to be quiet until you try to figure out where all of that knowledge uh, and all of that uh, supernatural divine knowledge came from. Look in uh, verse 41. They said, others said, this is the Christ. But some said... Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David? Yes, they know the scripture. And from the town of Bethlehem? Yes, they know the scripture where David was. But they are saying, will the Christ... Did they know where Jesus was born? They did not want to believe it, even if they knew it. So here they are, gripe, well, is, is the Christ going to come out of Galilee? The Bible says he's supposed to come out of Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. If you don't know what you're talking about, you, you probably ought to be quiet. Because they, they're speaking up and saying things when they don't know what they're saying. Look at verse 49. The crowd, and this is what they're saying back to these officers, they're trying to say, this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. That's what the Pharisees are saying. The Pharisees are saying, this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. You know what the Pharisees were acting like? They were the only ones who knew the law. Guess what? They didn't. They were mocking the crowd who was believing in Jesus. And they say, well, they believe in Jesus, but they don't know the law. Yeah, they probably knew it a little bit better than they did. They, they ought to have been quiet. Look at verse 40, or 52. They answered and said to Nicodemus, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Really? Uh, go back and read uh, 2 Kings. Guess where Jonah was from? Mm, yeah, he was from Galilee. Uh, guess where uh, Elijah was probably from? Galilee. Oh, but no prophet. You know, it's interesting how people can just say something and it's... If you don't know any better, it just sounds right, doesn't it? No prophet ever came out of... Well, actually, there, there was a prophet or two that came out of Galilee, but yet they dismiss it, hoping that nobody knows what they're talking about. If you don't know what you're talking about, probably ought to keep your mouth shut. 
The Bible says, if anyone speaks, let him speak what? It's the oracles of God. When we open our mouths, especially about the Word of God, hopefully we'll know what we're saying and uh, not overstep as some of these folks did. All right, let's get to the theme uh, of this chapter. And I had a difficult time trying to uh, summarize it because even this theme... um, even uh, spreads out into some of the other chapters, even into chapter 9 and chapter 10. But I think the the statement that's made in chapter 7, verse 43, kind of summarizes what you're going to see in this chapter. That there was a division among the people about Jesus. And you see it because throughout this chapter, there are some who say this, there are others who said this. There are some who say this, there are others who said this. There are some who believe, there's others who want to kill him. And so back and forth, you've got a division that's taking place over who Jesus is and what we're going to do with him. And so let's let's try to develop that theme as you go through this chapter. Several times in this chapter, it talks about these Jewish leaders and how they wanted to kill him. Now, John chapter 7 is about uh, about six months ago. Before Jesus would die. Look in verse 33 just for, a, uh, for Jesus and what he says in verse 33. Jesus said to them, I will be with you a little while longer. Well, we know this was the Feast of Tabernacles. And we know that about six months later was going to be the final uh, uh, Passover on which Jesus would be alive or died right before Passover. So Jesus only has about six months to live. And in these last six months... Um, The Jews, the Jewish leaders, wanted more than anything else to kill him. Now, when you read this phrase, the Jews, we we mentioned this in our introduction lesson at the very beginning of this quarter. Um, John uses that, those two words together, the Jews, he uses that more than any other Bible writer. Sixty plus times, and it's only found, uh, I think, about 130 something times in the whole New Testament. Uh, And so John uses that frequently in, in this gospel account. Um, but especially he uses it to talk about the religious leaders, the authorities. He's not talking about, most of the time, he's not talking about the whole Jewish race. Jesus himself was a Jew, wasn't he? The Jews sought to kill Jesus. Was Jesus seeking to kill himself? The apostles were Jews, weren't they? Were the apostles seeking to, so he's using the Jews throughout this, uh, this account to speak especially about these Jewish authorities, but frequently, especially in this chapter, they're trying to find him. They sought for him while they were at the Feast of Tabernacles. Four times in this chapter it says they sought to kill him. Three times it says they sought to take him. And when people started to believe in him, they weren't going to sit by. Look in verse 31. Verse 31 says, many of the people. How many of them? Many of them, not some of them, not a few of them. Many of the people believed in Jesus and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? Verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things. The Pharisees heard the crowd saying, This guy's got to be the Christ. Who would ever come and do more than what he's done? The Messiah wouldn't do more than he's He's got to be the Messiah that was promised. The Pharisees heard them believing in him and saying, This has got to be the Messiah. They weren't going to sit idly by Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. These officers were like the uh, temple officers. They're kind of like the temple police, you might say. They were the ones who were to keep order in the temple grounds. And if these people were going to start believing in Jesus, no, 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 no. We're going to take care of him. And so throughout throughout this chapter, uh, they they do all that they can to seek opportunities uh, to take him. Back in verse... uh, Back in verse 7, where Jesus is addressing his brothers, he says, the world cannot hate you, but he says, it hates me. In verse 7, why does Jesus say that the world, these Jewish leaders, why do they hate him? What does he say in verse 7? Why do they hate him? Because he testified... That their deeds, that their works were evil. Yeah, I guess if you go around telling people that what they're doing is a sin and that what they're doing is going to condemn them to hell, would they hate you? 
Well, some of them would. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that their deeds are evil or that their deeds are sinful. The world hated Jesus for, for a number of reasons. Jesus states one here that he said that I'm teaching that their deeds are evil. He talked about that back in chapter 3. But you also see in chapter 5 and 6 that Jesus uh, spoke the truth about their hearts. In chapter 5 he says you're searching the scriptures but you're doing it for the wrong reason. You're not really trying to find the truth. And then in chapter 6 he says you're coming and following after me. You're seeking me but only because you want something else to eat. You're only following me for the loaves and the fishes. And then it says that they became, Jesus says they became angry uh, with him. In verse 23, they had become angry with him because he made a man completely whole on the Sabbath day. That sounds like a good reason to be angry with Jesus, right? To make a guy who's been uh, sick and, and has been an invalid for 38 years to make him completely well. Oh, we're going to be angry with Jesus about that. That makes sense, doesn't it? Well, back in their minds and in their traditions, uh, seemingly made sense to them. So they're seeking to kill him. They hate him for what he's saying. They hate him for what he's doing. And so they lash out at him. They begin mocking him. We already saw what they said in verse 15, but it's interesting that they say, how does this, how does this man... Uh, underline in your mind those words, this man. This guy? Really? Th this, the son of Joseph and Mary? Th th this, this carpenter? How does this guy know? How does he know the, the, the truth? How does he know the Old Testament? How does he know the law? He's never gone through our schools. He's never been educated in our schools. How, how does this guy know anything? Not only, say it to, uh, not only saying it to mock and ridicule, ridicule Jesus, but more importantly, saying it so that other people can hear them say it. To spread that disbelief. But they mocked him for that. Look at verse 35. When Jesus told them that he was only going to be with them a little bit longer in verse 33. Uh, in verse 34, he says, you're going to seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. They, they said in verse 35, well, where does he intend to go? Are we going to play hide and seek? What is, what, does he have a better hiding place than any of us know about? How is he going to go away and we're not going to be able to find him? Make fun of him. Make fun of what he's saying. And again, try to cast some kind of doubt. Uh, put him in some kind of, uh, of a foolish light so that people won't listen to him. So the Jews wanted to kill him. These religious leaders, and we've already seen that his own brothers, his own brothers didn't believe in him. Go back and look at those first few verses of the chapter. The Feast of Tabernacles, verse, uh, well, start in verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. Why did he walk in Galilee? Remember, Galilee's up north. Judea's down in the south, and that's where Jerusalem is. Verse 1 says Jesus walked in Galilee. This is six months before he dies. Why did he not walk in Judea? According to chapter 7 verse 1. Why did he not walk in Judea? Because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Just a thought here. If you knew that there were people seeking to kill you in a certain city. Um, would it be on your bucket list to make sure you go to that city? Maybe the last item on there, right? If you know some people are seeking to kill you, are you going to go there? If you know some people are seeking to make fun of you, to pull you down, to make, to, to, to make some kind of a fool out of you, are you going to just run there? Or if you happen to know, because Jesus knows all things, that if you stay in Galilee, that there are hearts that are more receptive to truth. That there are people who are actually going to seek and to listen to what you say. Jesus isn't staying away from Judea just because he's scared of being killed. He's staying in Galilee because there are people who will listen to what he's saying. Jesus wanted them to learn the truth. So verse 2, the Feast of Tabernacles had come. There were three annual feasts that we learned from the book of Leviticus. 
uh, three annual Jewish feast, which required all male Jews to go to Jerusalem. Here's a Feast of Tabernacles. That's one of those feasts. Jesus is a male Jew. He's got to go to Jerusalem to fulfill the law. Feast of Tabernacles came. His brothers, therefore, said to him in verse 3, Depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. You know, I read that verse in light of verse 1, and, and I begin to think that they were intentionally wanting to put their brother in harm's way. You didn't have a brother like that, did you? David, why are you laughing? Did you have a brother like that who would intentionally do something to you to put you into harm's way? Joel didn't do that, did he? To say, hey, David, go and do, know all, knowing all the while you're going to break your arm and he was going to laugh his head off. Here's his brothers, I think, trying to put him into harm's way. Verse 4. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. Here they are. Plant, it's, if you read verse 4 and then you read the temptations that the devil placed in front of Jesus, there's a lot of similarity. Hey, brother, don't you want everybody to know who you are? Hey, brother, aren't you trying to get everybody's attention so that they'll believe in you? Then you need to go down there. Stop doing this stuff in secret. Go on down there so that everybody can see you and know you. For his brothers... Well, I didn't finish verse 4. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for even his brothers did not believe in him. You think about how painful that must have been for Jesus, that all the while he's trying to, the Bible says that he came to seek and to save that which was, what? Lost. Were his own brothers lost? Did he come to seek and to save his own brothers? Yeah. Does it hurt you that you have family members, I know many of you do, have family members who are lost and they don't want to hear anything you've got to say? No matter how kindly and how often you try to say something to them about, uh, about their soul and about eternity and about salvation, they won't hear you. Does that hurt? You want people to be saved. And probably above any other people, you want your family to be saved. And you've got some family members who won't hear it. Jesus had his own brothers who wouldn't hear it. So you got the Jews, you got his brothers, but then you've got the multitudes. Now when you think about, remember when, when he talks about the Jews, uh, when he uses that phrase, by and large he's usually talking about the religious leaders, the authorities, the, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the uh, Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish council, uh, kind of their supreme court kind of thing. That's who he's talking about when he says the Jews, talking about those authorities. But then there's, then there's the multitudes. If you go to, if you go to Jerusalem... On one of these three feast days, you're going to have thousands and thousands, if not over a million Jews in Jerusalem. And so here comes Jesus. He does go down, by the way. He, he told his brothers he wasn't going to go with them. But he obviously goes down to the Feast of Tabernacles. But he doesn't go openly with a lot of fanfare. He goes into town without the kind of circus and parade that would have accompanied his brothers going down there. And he goes to the temple to teach when he arrives there. Now remember, there's multitudes that are there. Thousands upon thousands of Jews, many of which have heard about him, uh, many of which want to, uh, want to listen to him uh, and to hear his teaching. And so uh, uh, here's the multitudes who, they become, uh, they become very interested in Jesus. And so we read this verse about there being some murmuring among the the multitudes concerning him. But in verse 12 it says, Nobody spoke openly about him. Here were these multitudes in verse 12. Where it says there was much complaining or murmuring, depending on what translation you have. And it says, they would, Why would they not speak openly? 
Verse 13, I guess it is. No one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Well, they're all Jews. So it's talking about these religious authorities. Why would they not speak openly about Jesus? If you were an average Jew and you started speaking favorably about Jesus, could that put you into, could that put you into harm's way with the rulers? If they don't believe he's the Christ and you start saying that he is, is there going to be a problem? Yeah. And so they weren't sure, they weren't sure what to say. And, and they were confused be, because, is this the next one yet? They were confused because even the religious leaders, they weren't consistent in their reaction to Jesus. We know that they want to kill him. And, and even Jesus, look at verse 19. Even Jesus brought out the fact uh, in front of everybody, he says, did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? In case there weren't some people in the crowd who knew it, he wanted them to know, hey, guess what? These folks are trying to kill me. So the multitudes in verse 20, the people, not the religious leaders, but the crowd at large says, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Perhaps they didn't even know the entirety of the plans the schemes that were in the mind of the rulers. But look at what Jesus says in verse 21. I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because a man because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath. It's going all the way back to the, uh, what Jesus did in chapter 5 in, uh, in healing that, that, uh, that man. What is Jesus pointing out here in these verses? Uh, this is later on in your handout. Uh, where is this? Down in letter I, where Jesus addressed head on. Letter number one under there, he pointed out how inconsistent they were enforcing the law. That's what this point's about. Jesus comes, Jesus comes to these leaders and says, the leaders who are saying, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. They said, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. You healed on the Sabbath. Therefore, you violated the law. Not supposed to work. You healed. You violated the law. What does Jesus say to them? Okay, you've got a law. You've got the law about the Sabbath. And then a baby's born. On what day, on what day were you supposed to circumcise a Jewish male baby? The eighth day. Would the eighth day of that child's life ever fall on the Sabbath? Hey, what happened to my screen? Would the eighth day ever fall on the Sabbath? Bill, what are you doing? You playing games with me? All right, Bill, you have... 20 seconds to fix it. All right. Would they ever, would they ever, uh, would they ever circumcise a baby on the Sabbath? You got 10 seconds, Bill. Would they ever, but wouldn't that, don't work on the Sabbath. You circumcise a baby on the Sabbath. Um, why did they do that? For a matter of purification? Jesus says, You've purified part of a baby on the Sabbath, but you say that's okay. He says, I healed a whole man on the Sabbath. Why is that not okay? Inconsistent in what they were doing. So verse 25, some of them from Jerusalem said, some of them, the, the, the crowd, the multitude, some of them said, is this not he whom they, the Jewish leaders, isn't this the guy they're trying to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? They're confused. The multitude's confused because the religious leaders, they want to kill Jesus. But here's Jesus right out there in the open, speaking in the open, and what are they saying to him? This is craziness here, this is what I'm saying. Jesus spoke openly in the temple, but those who wanted to kill him did absolutely nothing. 
if they were seeking an opportunity to kill him, here he is. He's right out here if you're trying to stop him from talking. And so the multitude's confused. What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to believe about him? There were some in the multitude, as you read through this chapter, there were some who did believe in him. I skipped right over that. There were some who did believe in him. I'm coming back to the believing part. Some said he is good. We read verse 31. Many believed in him, reasoning properly that if the Messiah came, he couldn't do any more than this guy's doing. In verse 40, some who heard him, they said, truly, this is the prophet. Others said in verse 41, this is the Christ. They might have been a little confused thinking he was the prophet of Deuteronomy 18 or, or the Christ of the Old Testament. Maybe they didn't connect the two. But there's still some honest hearts here who are looking at Jesus, listening to what he's saying and saying, you know, he's making sense. What he's saying fits. But then there were others who were still skeptical, who said, no, uh uh-uh. No, he, he's, he's not who you think he is. He's just deceiving you. He's just tricking you. They marveled at what he was saying. They were antagonistic towards him, saying that he had a demon. They were ignorant of the scriptures, and so they wrongly concluded that you couldn't know anything about Jesus. That was only because they didn't know the scriptures. They were ignorant of his place of birth, so they said, well, just don't listen to him because he came from Galilee. He didn't come from Bethlehem. Well, he did come from Bethlehem. So here, here's, here's the multitude. They're divided. That's the theme of this chapter. Divided because of Jesus. Some of them are believing. Some of them are skeptical and they're not believing. So what did Jesus do? A couple things real quick before time gets us. What did Jesus do? Jesus stayed true to his message. Oh, that's the next point. This is a really good point, but I don't have time for it. The temple officer said, nobody ever spake like this man spake. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus remained true to his mission, and he remained true to his Father. Even when there was division among the people about Jesus, Jesus did not deviate from what he came to do. That's a lesson for us. When people don't want to listen to truth, when they don't want to hear what we have to say about Scripture. That doesn't mean we should deviate. That doesn't mean that we should compromise. That doesn't mean that we should yield truth for even one hour. Jesus remained true to the mission for which He came. He remained true to His Father. As Jesus said, I didn't come to seek my own glory. I came to seek the glory of God, and so would you if you would embrace me and my teachings. And then finally, think about how what Jesus did in directing head-on to these teachers, how some of what he did may have led to this division. Look at what he says in verse 33 and 34, and then then we'll have to close. They sent these officers to to basically arrest Jesus. Verse 33 says, I'm going to be with you a little bit longer, but then I'm going to go and you won't. And and, and then I go to him who sent me. Who is Jesus talking to in verses 33 and 34? What does verse 33 say? Jesus said to, to who? Them. He's talking to the Pharisees who want to arrest him. He says to them in verse 34, you will seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Think about what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, I'm only going to be here a little bit longer. And when I leave here, I'm going back to the Father. And when I go back to the Father, what does He say? Can they come there? Where I go, you cannot come. Why not? Why could they not go to heaven? Because of their hearts. hearts. They didn't believe Him. They rejected Him. They rejected Scripture. They rejected the Father. And Jesus talking to the Pharisees, the most, in, in, in their minds, the most premier religious 
people on the face of the earth in that day. Of all of the Jewish groups, they were the top. They were the most devoted, devout. They were the most devoted. They were the most true to their cause. And most people believe they knew the law and followed the law the best. And what does Jesus say to them? You're not going to heaven. You're not going to go to heaven. Why? Because you're not following my plan. If you want to go, then you've got to do the will of God, verse 17. Wish we had more time to talk about this chapter, but read through this. Use your handout uh, as, a, as a guide as you read through this. And, uh, and then read chapter 8. We'll look at chapter 8 Wednesday night. Thanks for your good attention and participation.